can only really be one sermon illustration today. I can't imagine that preachers anywhere across the airwaves are telling stories about a guy they knew back in high school or of a football team's last second victory or telling jokes to warm up the crowd. All that any of us can think about or focus upon is the fact that we are living in a completely unique moment in human history, and it's a hard one. I'm sure most of you, like me, you just can't seem to stop reading news story after news story about just how dire this novel corona, coronavirus truly is. But I'm glad you're with us today because what we hear is God's word coming in to give us hope and strength and courage and resolve to face the darkness of our day. In this morning's reading from the Hebrew scriptures for Samuel, we see God looking for the, rightly, the right earthly king of Israel. And we find Samuel sad and discouraged and depressed that the first king had shown himself to be such a failure. But God essentially says, buck up, Hamper, stop mourning over Saul, and let's get on with the work I've given you to do. Go to Bethlehem and watch what I'm going to do. I'll show you that I'm God and that I'm always on the move. I'm always doing new things. I'm always bringing new life when all things seem lost. And before you know it, the tiniest son of a nobody family in a no-place town, David, is anointed and consecrated and set apart as the one who is going to lead God's people into new relationship with him. And we know that David wasn't perfect. It's interesting that he was the eighth son, the seventh son being the number of perfection, and he truly is the tagalong, the addendum, the forgotten one. And David showed himself over the course of his life to be a sinner in some shocking ways. But God is at work in him, doing something new in him. He had chosen him because he was humble and meek, and he knew that in good times and bad, in the glories of his kingdom, and in his abject moments of sinfulness, he depended upon God for all things. You may be in your home this morning, gathered around with your family, or you may be in your home alone today, feeling more alone than you've ever felt before. You may sit there feeling like God could not use you, couldn't use this stressful time in our lives, the human race, to do anything good. But God is the God who brings life to desert places. And he is still at work. Today's psalm is the best loved and most well known of all the psalms. And it is this eighth son of Jesse, this runt out in the field tending the sheep, this sinner named David. He is the one who wrote it. And surely it is of utmost comfort to us in these dark days. God has not abandoned us. He is still our shepherd. We want for nothing in our spirits because he's always with us. He brings us to good things, green pastures, still waters, restored souls, righteous pathways. And he never abandons us. He leads us through the hard times and the bad things, even in the valley of the shadow of death. And isn't that where we all are right now? We fear no evil in that valley. Because our shepherd is right here with us. God has promised that his goodness and his mercy will never abandon us. And if we live, we are his. And if we die, we are his. And if we hide our lives in Christ, we know that that last verse of David's is true. That we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And the world around us see that blazing light of hope held in the 23rd Psalm, meditated on by we who put our faith in Christ. May the world see that hope shining forth from us, especially in these darkest of days. 
But it's our reading from Ephesians that really made my heart leap as we read it this morning. In verse 8, Paul says this, You once were darkness, but now you are light. It's easy to read this and say that we once were in darkness, or we once walked in darkness, and then now we walk in the light of God. And those things are true. But Paul is saying something deeper here. He's echoing the words that our Savior Christ has taught us. That we once were darkness, but now we are light. If you are listening to this sermon today, and you are in Christ, then you are what Jesus said you are. You are the light of the world. In the words of Ephesians, you are the ones who imitate God, who walk in love, who resist sexual immorality and foolishness and impurity. You are the ones who used to be dead, but are now awoken by God, the God who has shown the light of Christ on you, and now you live. And it is now, it is now that the world most powerfully needs to see our light, the light that we are because of Jesus. Let me share something that I think most of us have been thinking, but I heard articulated really clearly by the youth minister of another church in our diocese this week, Taylor Ishii, down at Apostle Eastern Shore. We were on a Zoom conference call in the diocese, and Taylor said something like this. He said, imagine how different we are all going to be after all of this. We were horribly overscheduled. We rushed from place to place. We hardly had time to pray to God, let alone take a walk with our wife or our children or to pick up the phone and talk to a friend for as long as we wanted. But now suddenly we're home. We're sitting outside. We can't buy anything that we think is going to fill that gaping hole in our hearts. We only have one another. And we only have God. I think that Taylor is so right about that. And you know, we're just getting started. Most of us, I know that my family, my two little boys and my wife, we, we don't have a really good rhythm set up for this time of quarantine yet. But we're going to get better at it. All of us are. And imagine if we started waking up and started every day as a family by praying to God. We here at Christ Church have a daily morning prayer and a daily evening prayer service, but you don't have to watch our video feed to do it. You can do it from yourself, by yourself, with your family, um, or alone in your prayer closet out of the Book of Common Prayer. And we've been pointing you towards this online resource, www.dailyoffice2019.com. Use it. You have plenty of time to begin your days by talking to God. And, by, and to end your days with the evening prayer. Wake up and pray. Pray before you go to sleep. You know, it's what we've always known that we wanted to do as the followers of God, but somehow we never had the time. Well, you do now, my friends. And if we thought four months ago that we have never been more divided as a nation than we are right now, could this be the miracle that changes all of that? But what pulls a people together, a world more together, than fighting a common cause, fighting for the welfare, not just of me and mine, but the welfare of the whole human race? What light might God be shining in the world through the darkness of this virus? I think that this is going to change us all, root and branch and to people who have our hope and our focus where it belongs, on the God who's called us not to be darkness, but to be light, and to love one another as we've first been loved by Him. I said to begin this sermon that there could only be one sermon illustration today, that of this looming virus, but I'm wrong. I have another sermon illustration, and he's sitting right there behind those flowers, if you don't already know this, 
I'm happy to invite you to that man's wedding to his beautiful bride. It is today, this afternoon, at 4 p.m. Central Time. Father Morgan William Thomas Clark will wed Elizabeth Ann Riley in a live stream wedding service to which all of you are invited. I hear that many of the little girls in our parish are going to put on their princess dresses and watch Elizabeth come down the aisle. Um, you are all invited to be a part of that. Those two lovebirds were originally supposed to get married later in May with the bishop himself presiding. But in this uncertain time, Morgan and Elizabeth thought three things. One, we don't want to go into a lockdown quarantine living in separate places. For Elizabeth is living in the house that they will soon make their home, while Morgan has been living with a man in our church until their wedding date. And they said, that is an untenable circumstance if we're looking at months apart. Two, they realized that there's no guarantee that things would be lifted before our May wedding date. So they said, what are we waiting for? But thirdly, and most importantly, they thought, we know that God has called us to be married. We've already done all of our premarital work. We've signed all the paperwork. The bishop and all the priests that have shepherded us through this experience, they've all said that we are ready and all that is left for us is to be obedient to the call of God on our lives, to love one another in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, for as long as they live. So boom, the decision was made on Friday, and so this afternoon, you're going to get to see a moment of great light shining in the darkness. And it just so happens to be Latair Sunday, which is a Sunday when you can have flowers and uh, it's the day that weddings are permitted in the midst of Lent. Um, I learned just today that in the UK, it's Mothering Sunday. And that's because all of the downstairs people on Downton Abbey were allowed to go see their mothers on this day. It was a break in the austerity of Lent and a joyous reunion of families and a day of many weddings in an otherwise quite austere season. It's a joyous thing that today... Two people, a man and a woman, agreed to lay down their lives for one another, to vow before God that they will love one another the way that Christ loves the church and gave his life for her. In the midst of all this craziness, this wedding is a sign that God is still on the move. He's still changing hearts and bringing light into desert places. And Morgan, we are thrilled for you and thrilled for Elizabeth. Amen? amen. I hear an amen out there in Montgomery and beyond. Now, not all of you can arrange to be married this afternoon. But my prayer for you and for me, for my family and for yours, is that we find ways to be light in the darkness. For some of us, it will be to obey our earthly authorities and do the weird but vital things, the strange but vital thing of staying home for a good while. For some of us, it will be to call that person with whom we have conflict and do the hard work of reconciliation. For some of you, it will be to do heroic things, to go to work in the hospital or go to work in the grocery store both of which will be perilous jobs in the days ahead, but necessary for one's fellow man. But all of us, all of us, my friends, can do the light-giving thing of praying, and praying, and praying, acknowledging that we have no power in ourselves to fix this thing, but that God is on the move. God is not done doing things even in the midst of this darkness, bringing life to us, still at work in our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.